Good morning, First Church. Everybody doing all right out there? Man, it's so good to be here with each and every one of you in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And um, I even know how to pronounce it. I told the 830 service that uh, I'm lived in D.C. Metro for about 10 years, but I'm from Louisiana originally, so I know how to talk, and I can pronounce Fayetteville right, right? Awesome. It's so good to be here, and I know it's the first time my wife and I have been here. My wife, Kimberly, sitting right there. So good to have her with me today. Um, my first time to be here, and we're just overwhelmed to see what God is doing here um, in this church and through the ministry of First Church in this area. But I have known your pastors for quite a long time, for a couple of decades, longer than we both would care to admit, I'm sure. But um, pastors uh, Daryl and Lanita and their amazing family are some longtime friends of ours. And I want you to know, in case you don't, which I'm sure you do, you have the best of the best leading First Church. And aren't you thankful for your pastor and his family? Amazing, gifted leaders and communicators, and um, just amazing to hear what God is doing uh, through them and through the ministry of First Church. All right, if you got your Bibles, I want to direct your attention to the 118th Psalm. I'm going to start there, and uh, we'll see where God takes us here in the next few minutes, all right? And I'll say at the outset um, this morning, I'm preaching for mind change. Uh, a lot of times in church, uh, we talk about preaching for heart change, and that's important, um, but we don't quite often preach toward mind change as we do heart change. And I've come to realize that your heart can be changed, but if you don't change your mind, um, you're going to be frustrated in your Christian life, amen? Uh, because to be a follower of Jesus means I have to interact and see the world differently. I have to see the world and everything around me and that's happening to me through his eyes, not my own eyes. And that requires a mind shift. Matter of fact, Paul talked about that in Romans, the 12th chapter. He said, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your, not heart, you got to renew your mind. You change your thinking, you'll change your life. And so I hope that before we are done here today, um, we can change the way that we think about some things. Psalm 118 says, give thanks to the Lord for he is what? He's good, y'all. Look at somebody and say, he's good. His faithful love endures forever. I'm going to skip on down to verse 6. He says, the Lord is for me, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Yes, the Lord is for me. He will, not maybe, not if he's got a good day, not if I've been good enough. He just will help me. I will look in triumph at those who hate me. So the psalmist has given us two facts that you should never forget about the God you serve. And that is, number one, he's good. Say he's good. And then he said, he's for me. Say, he's for me. You ought to wake up every day of your life while you're brushing your teeth in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and state those two facts and start your day every day knowing that. That God is good and God is for me. Come on, say it one more time. God is good and God is for me. And because of that, verse 17, I'm going to skip down there. He said, I will not die Instead, I will live to tell what the Lord has done. God is good. He is for me. And I will not die. But I will live. I wonder how your life might look differently than it does now through your eyes and how my life might could change if I begin to live every day of my life not just thinking, but really convinced and believing those two facts. That God is good and God is for me. Because to be honest with you, I don't know if you can relate to this or not, but there are days I have challenges even in my own life of believing those two things. There are some days where it seems like it's the opposite. <laughs> That, that I don't know if you've ever had that kind of day. They're like, I'm not, I'm not quite sure God, maybe God's good for other people, but 
you know, somehow he lost my address somewhere and uh, I, 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 he don't feel too good right now. And I certainly don't believe that God is for me because of what is happening to me. Life can feel that way. But I want to push back on that feeling and that type of thinking and tell you that in spite of the way you feel at times, that those facts are still true. That God is good and God is for me. And that I and you and everybody that you know that calls Jesus Lord, we are not moving toward death and disaster. See, you and I are part of a society right now. I don't know if you've been paying attention or not, but there's a lot of crazy stuff happening around us right now here in our country, around the world, and um, there's all these prophets of doom and gloom, and uh, it's real easy to get sucked into the feeling of, of, of the culture, and that is we're not very um, positive about what's going to happen in the future. It, we're anxious, we're fearful, and all of those things. But you see, the psalmist, he said, I will not fear, because I know God is good, and He is for me, and in spite of what it may look like right now through my eyes and what I might be feeling in my emotions, according to the truth of God, I am not moving toward death and disaster. I am moving toward goodness and I am moving toward life. As a matter of fact, God, I want to convince you here this morning, has leveraged everything in creation and he has leveraged everything in your life for life, not destruction. In other words, that means everything that is happening to you and everything that you are experiencing, even though it may not feel good, even though it feels uncomfortable at times, and we can tell ourselves, this thing's going to kill me. I'll never make it through and just fill in the blank whatever you're experiencing in fact, that is not true. That God has the ability, Paul said it like this in Romans the 8th chapter, that God can work all things. Somebody say all things. All things, the good and the bad. God can work all things for the good to those that are called according to His purpose. That not everything is good, but he is moving us toward good. And the problem is, he would say, Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 13, that he would talk about like the, the, the issue is the way that we see and think right now. Because in our broken, fallen state and with all the brokenness in the world, he says we can't quite see the picture very clearly. He says we see through a glass darkly. And, and we can't quite understand or comprehend on this side of the glass in our brokenness what all God is up to and what he's doing. He said, but there will come a day when, when, when Jesus wraps everything up finally and heaven and earth are joined together and, 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 and the kingdom of God has fully come and, and everything is reconciled back to God. He said, on that day, we will be able to see as God sees and we will see the whole picture clearly. And we will know that in fact, God wins. I don't know if you realize that or not. But hey, God wins in the end, everybody. That, that we are not moving toward death and destruction. That God has already set the table. He's already fought the war and won the victory. And he and all of his kids are not moving toward destruction and fear and despair. We are moving toward goodness and life. But the problem is, in this broken side, on this side of the glass, we can't always comprehend what God is up to. Many of us live our life in the context of Jacob in the Old Testament. I don't have time to read you his whole story, but I want to set it up really quickly for you here. Um, Jacob was the grandson of Abraham. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and he would be... Uh, uh, his sons, he had 12 sons, they would become known the 12 tribes of Israel. One of Jacob's sons, one of his younger sons' name was Joseph, and he was kind of his father's favorite. At a young age, Joseph had some dreams, and in these dreams he saw his brothers and his parents bowing down to him. And Joseph, being young and not full of wisdom, decides he's going to share this dream with his older brothers. 
Now, I don't know if you have siblings or not, but I'm sure if you do, you understand the dynamic. Um, if you got like a snotty-nosed little brat of a brother, you don't really want him coming and telling you, yeah, you're going to bow down to me one day and serve me. Like, that didn't go over well. And the fact that, you know, he was Jacob's favorite didn't go over well either. So um, they devised this plan that they sell him into slavery. How'd you like to have those siblings? <laughs> Um, they're going to sell him into slavery and send him away, and they go and tell their father, hey, while we were out in the fields working, a wild beast came, killed Joseph, he's gone. And so Jacob will begin to mourn the death of his precious son. And for some two decades later, Jacob would think that Joseph is dead. But Joseph was not dead. He had been sold into slavery. He goes into Egypt. He works for Potiphar. He gets lied on, gets thrown in prison. Gets forgot about in prison, but eventually, after about two decades, Pharaoh pulls him out of prison and he interprets some dreams. And Pharaoh makes him prime minister of all of Egypt. And then famine hits the land. And now we go back to Jacob and his family, and they're starving. They don't have any food, but there's food in Egypt. So he sends 10 of his sons, holds Benjamin the youngest back with him, go buy food. And wouldn't you know it, some two decades earlier, Joseph's little dream starts to become reality because who do they have to go to ask for food to buy? Their younger brother, who they had sold into slavery 20 years ago. But Joseph conceals himself like any good brother would. He starts to play with them. He don't let them know it's him. And then he accuses them of being spies and says, hey, your spies are coming. You want to destroy. I'm going to imprison everybody. And they're like, no, 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 no. That's not what we, we're just wanting food. We're, we're all sons of one man. Uh, there's, there's 10 of us. There, we have a younger brother, uh, the 11th one, that's back with our father. His name is Benjamin. And so this is what Joseph does. He says, well, I tell you what, I'm going to hold Simeon, the oldest, in prison. You go back and get Benjamin. Bring him here, and I'll know you're telling the truth. And that's what happens. So they go back, nine of them, to Jacob. And they begin to tell him what happened. And here is where we pick up in Genesis, the 42nd chapter. It says, as they emptied out their sacks, there in each man's sack was the bag of money he had paid for the grain. And the brothers and their father were terrified when they saw the bag of money. Jacob exclaimed, watch what Jacob says, because Jacob is me and Jacob is you. This is how we live our life. Now, all of this stuff is going on over here in Egypt, but Jacob has no clue. He's on this side of the glass. And in this distress, he says, you are robbing me of my children. Joseph is gone. Simeon is gone. And now you want to take Benjamin too. And then he ends by saying this, everything is going against me. Anybody ever felt like that? <laughs> had those days? I've had multiple of those days, right? He says, everything is going against me. But I want you to notice the context in which Jacob is making these emphatic statements. He states, Joseph is gone. But I would ask you this morning, was that true? No, Joseph was not gone. He was not dead. He had not seen him in 20 years, but Joseph was very much alive. He had been in Egypt, and now he was the second most powerful man in the entire country. He says, Simeon is gone. Is that true? No, he's not gone. You may feel like, Jacob, you have lost your son, and now your son Simeon. You feel like you've lost two sons. But actually, Simeon is not gone. He's being protected by the most powerful nation in the world at that time. He says, everything is against me. But actually, everything was not against him. On this side of the glass, he felt like, I can't catch a break. And I'm losing things that are dear to me. And it hurts and it's painful. And all it felt like was loss. But on the other side of the glass where God was at work. Where Jacob's physical eyes could not see. Everything was not working against him. Everything was working for him. God had been moving pieces like a 
piece of uh, like like chess uh, like a chess piece on a chessboard, and he had been putting things in place not to bring pain to Joseph, but rather to draw Joseph back into Egypt so that he could preserve the entire family. Jacob, everything is not against you. Everything is working for you. You just have to catch up to what God is doing. And I want to talk to us here about the way that we think in our life. Because many times we live our life in the context of Jacob. When things happen to us and they bring pain and they're unexpected. And, 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 and it brings fear and anxiety even sometimes in our life. It can be very easy to think that all these things are against me. And things are falling apart. And, and, and I'm losing things that are very dear to me. Whenever you lose a job. Or maybe whenever someone betrays you that you trusted deeply. Or maybe you lose a relationship with, 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 a, with a spouse or a family member or, or you get a diagnosis. I don't know what it is, but there's all kinds of circumstances that can, we can experience in life that can make us feel like Jacob felt that day. Everything is against me. And I can't catch a break. And it feels like I'm moving toward Death and disaster. As a matter of fact, you and I are conditioned from a very early age to think that way. We are conditioned to think from a very early age that we get here on earth and we begin from the first day that we're born moving toward death. That's the way we think. I mean, you've heard it said, what's the two things that you can just take to the bank? What's two things that are true in life? Taxes and death. How many of you know that to be true? Taxes, amen, everybody. Right? And death. We think that way. But I want to change the way you think and tell you that through Jesus Christ, He has reordered all of creation. And you are not moving toward death. You and I are moving toward life. We are moving toward goodness. We are moving toward the power of God Almighty. And things, when they, I know they may feel like in your life they are falling apart. They are not falling apart. I would suggest to you they are falling in place. That God holds your life and your future and your family and your career and your relationships in the palm of his hand. And he tells you and me, if you will trust me, I know you may go through some things that stress you out. And I know you may experience things because you're in a broken world that you cannot control. But trust that I am moving you toward life to the fullest, he would say in John 10.10. That you are not... Moving toward death, you are actually moving toward life. As a matter of fact, we're so conditioned to think this way that when something bad happens to us, a lot of times people will rhetorically say, well, that's just. We have come to think that life equates to death and destruction and bad things. But that's viewing life and thinking on this side of the glass. That is not thinking with the mind of Christ. That's why the biblical writer said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You have to begin to think and see the world differently. It is not just life. No, 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 no. Life is not bad. Life is good. And God is moving us toward the fulfillment of all things good in your your life and in my life. That God is in control. That he has leveraged everything for our life. We even say this sometimes we... When we experience some hardships and, and it, it feels like a struggle in our life, um, you know, we, we grasp for a statement of faith and say, well, God's going to work it out. Can I suggest to you that's not true? God is not going to work it out. You didn't know a preacher was going to come and say this to you this morning, did you? If you're, if you're in the stressful space and feeling fear, anxiety, all that, God, God's not going to work that out. The truth and the reality is God has already worked that out. We just haven't caught up yet that we are moving 
moving through things that cause us discomfort and pain at times. But God has already won the victory. And God has already got things in place on the other side of the glass. If we can just trust Him and believe that He is who He said He is. He said, I have come that you may have life and you may have it more abundantly. No matter what you're feeling right now. No matter what you're experiencing right now. God has the ability and the power. He's not trying to figure out how am I going to get you through this and how am I going to to work this out in Jeffrey's life and man I didn't expect that no 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 when I'm going through that God is already on the other side at the end of it saying come on Jeffrey don't give up don't start thinking in your natural mind but understand and realize that if you just keep walking I am pulling you to life I am pulling you to where I want you to be because he has leveraged everything for life I want to give you this in Matthew the 22nd chapter um, so the Jesus is in, in his ministry. He was often confronted by the religious leaders, and there was this group of them called the Sadducees. And one of the things that make the Sadducees unique is they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so they concoct this elaborate thing to to bring to Jesus, and they say, "Hey, Jesus, you know the law of Moses says that if a brother marries a woman." And that lady dies and, and, and she didn't bear him, or, or the, the man dies, the husband dies, and, and she didn't have a son to carry on the family name. That the next brother of the family should marry her and sire a son to carry on the family name. Yes, that's in the law of Moses. So let me ask you this. There were seven brothers. The oldest one married a woman. They didn't have kids. He died. So the next brother marries the woman. They don't have a kid. And he dies. So now the third brother marries the woman, no kid, third brother dies. I want to know who the fourth brother is, because if I'm him, I'm not doing it. There's a little bit of a pattern happening here. But he does his brotherly duty, and he marries her, and sure enough, he dies, no kid. All the way through, seven brothers, no kids, they all marry her, they all die. The original black widow, right? And then they ask him, in the resurrection, which they didn't even believe, who will be her husband? Good question, I guess. Matthew twenty two twenty nine. Jesus replied, your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. For when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. But now as to whether there will be a resurrection of the dead, which is what you're really getting at. Haven't you ever read about this in the scriptures? Long after, so I want to just get up on the edge of your seat, lean in and listen to what Jesus says here. Because sometimes we can just gloss over this because it's something that we've heard or read a hundred times that we don't think about what he says. Listen to what Jesus says. Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, God said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So he is the God of who? He is the God of the living, not the dead. And when the crowds heard him, they were astounded at his teaching. Now, why would the crowd be astounded at the teaching of Jesus? Jesus had just given them a concept that radically challenged the way that they had seen the world and the way that they had thought their entire life. Even people that knew the law of Moses like the back of their hand. He astounded them with this saying. Because what did Jesus just say? He said, God said, I am the God of Abraham, not I was the God of Abraham. I am the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So he is the God of the living. He was saying, they ain't dead. You think they've been dead for generations because you see and think on this side of the glass. But there is another dimension and another world that is more real than the one you're experiencing in your brokenness. And if you could step through the glass... You would see they never died. 
That's why when he took Peter, James, and John up on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Bible said that God opened their eyes and all of a sudden they went up with Jesus and with Jesus was standing two other guys, Moses and Elijah, who had quote-unquote died hundreds of years before. But in that moment, Jesus said, I'm going to pull the glass back a little bit. And I'm going to let you see what's really going on. I want you to understand, Peter, James, and John, you're about to go into ministry and you're going to be opposed. And you're going to be persecuted. And people are going to say nasty things about you. And life isn't going to work out the way you want it to all, all the ways. But I'm going to pull the glass back and I'm going to let you see. It doesn't matter what happens to you in this life or what stress may come on you. Don't stop because the deck is stacked already and you are not going to die. You are going to live and I will fulfill my purpose in you and I will get glory out of you because I have leveraged everything for life. That's what he did at the cross, ladies and gentlemen. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw who? Not some, not a few. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. You see, that's why the enemy is so stupid. You know, that's in your Bible, right? Paul wrote it in Colossians. He said that the enemy's dumb. He said because had the enemy had the ability to understand what was going to happen when they... I mean, Jesus even told them, if I be lifted up, I'm going to draw all men to life. But the devil's so dumb, he did it anyway. Because on this side of the glass, a cross looks like defeat. A cross looks like death. I, I like to call the cross heaven's lever. Because everything was fine for the devil until those Roman soldiers pulled the lever. But the moment they picked that transom up off the ground, they pulled the cross up and planted it and lifted our Savior up for all to see was the moment He said, it's finished. It's done. Not it's going to be finished. Not I still got some other stuff to work out. But everything that I need to bring life to you has now been accomplished. And it is over. And so what looked like death and defeat actually put Jesus in the grave. And when Jesus got to the grave, death didn't kill him. He killed death. And when he killed death. Do you know this is in your Bible, ladies and gentlemen? The Bible says that when Jesus resurrected from the dead, that there were people in Jerusalem. Go read it for yourself later today. That not only did Jesus come out of the grave, but he said there were believers in Jerusalem that saw saints of old. I, I got a little old school Pentecost in me. So I'm trying to stay buckled up here this morning. All right. He, he said... He said there were, there were saints of old that had died long before that they saw up walking the streets of Jerusalem. What happened at the resurrection? God pulled back the glass a little bit and let people see there's another dimension that is happening. You think that these people are dead. They're not dead. They're up walking around. I have leveraged everything for life. So ladies and gentlemen, I've come to preach hope to you today. Stop thinking that the thing that you're going through is going to destroy you or kill you or take your family out. Jesus has already won the battle and he's leveraged everything. Okay, my time's up. Stand, 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 stand. We got to get y'all out of here so we can get the next group in. But I could preach 30 more minutes. Y'all pulled the preach out of me this morning. He's leveraged everything. So here's the best thing you can do in your life. Your strength is not in your fight. Your strength is in your surrender. I'm going to say it again. Your strength is not in your fight. It's in your surrender. When we go through things that are uncomfortable for us that, that we don't have control over, our natural tendency on this side of the glass is we want to play God. We want to control it. And we spend so much energy and effort and emotional energy 
trying to control things that we have no control over. Instead of believing that God is good and God is for me, and that though I may not can control this, and though this may bring pain, I don't know how long you'll have to experience it, to be honest with you. I know Jacob had to live 20 years with the pain of losing his son. But in reality, he had not lost him. He just hadn't caught up to God yet. What, are you, what, what have you declared as truth in your life like Jacob did when he said Joseph is dead? What are you saying in your life as emphatic truth that in fact is not true? You just haven't caught up to God yet. But if you will stop fighting stuff you can't control and you will surrender to the God of the universe, He will pull you to life. He will pull you. And He may not deliver you from the stress in the moment, but He can deliver the stress out of you. It's like Peter when he walked the water. God didn't calm the storm and then say, come on out here and walk on it. No, 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 no. The moment Peter stopped fighting the stuff he couldn't control, the wind and the waves, and just surrendered to Jesus, the storm kept going, but the storm lost its power over him. And he walked over the storm. And God is saying to somebody in a storm right now, it's not going to kill you. But you can kill yourself trying to fight stuff you can't control. So instead of trying to fight it, why don't you surrender to me and I will show you a highway on top of the waves where you will find peace that passes understanding. And when you get to the other end of the highway, you will know that I can work it for your good. And I am bringing you not toward death and destruction, but toward life because I am good. And I'm for you. Bow your head with me. God is good, and God is for you. God is good, and God is for you. And He has leveraged everything in your life for life. In Jesus' name I pray right now over every man, every woman, every boy, every girl in this room that may be experiencing a storm, stress, that may feel like Jacob standing there saying everything is against me. I pray in this moment, God, that you would give us eyes to see and that you would transform our thinking and know that even though we're in a stressful situation, you can deliver us from the stress and that you are moving us toward your purpose and your plan and your goodness in our life. And everybody say in Jesus' name.